Nathaniel's Corner. Enjoy the video. Hello, everybody. My name is Nathaniel, and I am going to be reading Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Um, in this book, there's not really uh, chapters, per se. Um, so I'm just going to you know, read about the page... How many pages are in this book? There are a total of uh, three hundred and six page pages. So I'm gonna read the first one hundred pages in this video. Um, let's see how much we've got. It's been a minute already. Sorry for this cranking, I'm on my bed, and my bed is squeaky, and I can't get comfortable, so one second, I'm just gonna, you know, no, I don't know, I don't know, I'm gonna take this time and quickly get comfortable, and I'm back, <coughs> okay, so let's just, uh, get into it, uh, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds, and, yeah, Don't nobody believe nothing these days, which is why I haven't told nobody the story I'm about to tell you. The truth is, you probably ain't got. The truth is, you probably ain't gun believe it either. Gun think I'm lying or I'm losing it, but I'm telling you, the story is true. It happened to me, really. It did. It so did. My name is Will, William, William Holloman, but to my friends and people who know me, uh, know me, just Will. So call me Will, because after I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you'll either want to be my friend or not want to be my friend at all. Either way, you'll know me know me. I'm only William to my mother and my brother Sean whenever he was trying to be funny. Now, I'm wishing I would have laughed more at his dumb jokes. Because the day before yesterday, Sean was shot and killed. I don't know you. Don't know your last name, if you got brothers or sisters, or mothers, or fathers, or cousins. That be like brothers and sisters or aunties or uncles. That be like mothers and fathers. But if the blood inside of you is on the inside of someone else, you never want to see it on the outside of them. The sadness is just so hard to explain. Imagine waking up and someone, a stranger, got you strapped down, got pillars shoved into your mouth, gripping a tooth. Somewhere in the back, out of the big important ones, and rips it out. Imagine the knocking in your head, the pressure pushing through your ears, the blood pooling. But the worst part, the absolute worst part, is the constant slipping of your tongue into the new empty space. Where you know a tooth is supposed to be, but ain't no more. It's so hard to say Sean's dead. Sean's dead. Sean's dead. So strange to say. So sad. But I guess not surprising, which I guess is even stranger. And even sadder. The day before yesterday, me and my friend Tony were outside talking about whether or not we'd get any taller now that we're 15. When Sean was 15, he grew a foot, maybe a foot and a half. That's that's when he gave me all the clothes he couldn't fit. Tony kept saying he hoped he grew because he, even though he was the best ball player around here our age, he was also the shortest. And everybody knows you can't go all the way when you're that small unless you can really jump, like fly. 
and then there were shots. Everybody ran, ducked, hid, tucked themselves tight, did what we've all been trained to do. Pressed our lips to the pavement and prayed the boom followed by a buzz of bullets ain't meet us. <clears throat> Sorry. After the shots, me and Tony waited like we always do for the rumble to stop before picking our heads up and poking our heads out to count the bodies. This time, there was only one. Sean. I've never been in an earthquake. Don't know if this was even close to how they are, but the ground definitely felt like to, it opened up and ate me. Things that always happen whenever someone is killed around here. Number one, screaming. Nobody screams. Not everybody screams. Usually just moms, girlfriends, daughters. In this case, it was Leticia, Sean's girlfriend, on her knees, kissing his forehead between shrieks. I think she hoped her voice would somehow keep him alive would clot the blood, but I think she knew, deep down the deepest part of her downness, she was kissing him goodbye. And my mom, meaning low, moaning low, not my baby, not my baby, why? Hanging over my brother's body like a dimmed light post. Number two, Sarah's. Lots and lots of sirens howling, cutting through the sounds of the city, except the screams. The screams are always heard over everything, even the sirens. Number three, questions. Cops flashed lights in our faces and we all turned to stone. Did anybody see anything? A young officer asked. He looked honest, like he ain't never done this before. You can always tell a newbie. They always ask questions like they really expect answers. Did anyone see anyone? Did anybody see anyone? I ain't seen nothing. Marcus Andrews, the neighborhood know-it-all, said. Even he knew better than to know anything. In case you wait, no. Gunshots make everybody deaf and blind, especially when they make somebody dead. Best to become invisible in times like these. Everybody knows that. Even Tony flew away. I'm not sure if the cops ask me questions. Maybe. Maybe not. Couldn't hear nothing. Ears filled up with heartbeats like my head was being held underwater. Like I was holding my breath. Maybe I was. Maybe I was. Hoping I could give some back to Sean. Or maybe... Somehow, join him. When bad things happen, we can usually look up and see the moon, big and bright, shining over us. That always made me feel better. Like there's something out there beaming down on us in the dark. But the day before yesterday, when Sean died, the moon was off. Somebody told me once a month the, moon's, the moon blacks out and becomes new. And the next night be back to normal. I'll tell you one thing. The moon is lucky it's not down here. Where nothing is ever new. <clears throat> I stood there, mouth clenched, tight enough to grind my teeth down to dust, and look at Sean, lying there like a piece of furniture left outside, like a stained up couch draped in a in a gold in a gold chain. Them fuckers ain't even gonna snatch it. Random thought. Blood soaked into a t-shirt, blue jeans and boots. Looks a lot like chocolate syrup. Then the glow from the street lights hit it. But I know I ain't but I know ain't nothing sweet about blood. I know it ain't like chocolate syrup. At all. In his hand, 
a corner store plastic bag, white with red letters. Thank you. 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 Have a nice day. In that bag, special soap from my mother's. In that bag, special soap from my mother's eczema. I have seen her scratch until it bleeds. Take out the pus bubbles and flaky scales. Curse the invisible thing trying to eat her. But maybe there's something invisible trying to eat all of us as if we are beef. Beef gets passed down like name brand t-shirts around here. Always too big, never ironed out. Gets inherited like a trunk of fool's gold or a treasure map leading to nowhere. Came knocking on my brother's life, kicked the damn door down and took everything except his gold chain. In the yell tape that says do not cross gets put up. The, then the yell tape that, re, that says do not cross gets put up. And there's nothing left to do but go home. The tape lets people know that this is a murder scene. As if we ain't already know that. The crowd backs its way into buildings and down blocks until nothing is left but the tape. Sean was zipped into a bag and rolled away, his blood added to the pavement galaxy of bubblegum stars. The tape framed like it was art, and the next day, kids would play mummy with it. Back on the eighth floor, I locked myself in my room and put a pillow over my head to muffle the sound of my mom's mourning. She sat in the kitchen, sobbing into her palms, which she peeled on away only to lift glass to the mouth. Which, eat, with each sip, came a brief silence, and then each brief silence, I snuck in a breath. I felt like crying, which felt like another person trapped behind my face. The fist punching the backs of my eyes, feet kicking my throat in the spot where the swallow starts. Stay put, I whispered to him. Stay strong, I whispered to me. Because crying is against the rules. The rules. Number one. Crying. Don't. No matter what. Don't. Number two. Snitching. Don't. No matter what. Don't. Number three. Revenge. If someone you love gets killed, find the person who killed them and kill them. The invention of the rules ain't come from my brother, his friends, my dad, my uncle, the guys outside, the hustlers and shooters, and definitely not from me. Another thing about the rules, they weren't meant to be broken, they were meant for the broken to follow. Our bedroom, a square yellowy paint, two beds on the left, on one to the left of the door, one to the right, two dressers, one in front of the bed to the left of the door, one in front of the bed to the right. In the middle, a small TV. Sean's side was the left, perfect, almost. Mine, the right, pigsty, no sleep. Sean's wall had a poster of Tupac, a poster of Biggie. My wall had... An anagram I wrote and messed up scribble with a pencil in case mom made me erase it. Scare equals cares. Anagram is when you take a word and rearrange the letters to make another word. And sometimes the words are still somehow connected. An example would be canoe and ocean. Same letters, different words somehow still make sense together, like brothers. The middle drawer was the only thing ever out of place on Sean's side of the room, like a random jagged tooth in a perfect mouth, jammed tight between the top drawer of shirts folded into neat rectangles stacked like project floors and the bottom drawer of socks and underwear. Off track, stuck, forced in at an angle. 
Seemed like the middle drawer was jagged up on purpose to keep me and Mom out. And Sean's gun in. I won't pretend that Sean was the kind of guy who was home by curfew. The kind of guy who called and checked in about where he was, who he was with, what he was doing. He wasn't. Not after 18, which is when our mother took our hands, took her hands off him. Pressed them together and began to pray. That he wouldn't go to jail. That he wouldn't get Letitia pregnant. That he wouldn't die. My mother used to say, I know you're young. Gotta get it out. But just remember, when you're walking in the nighttime, make sure the nighttime ain't walking into you. But Sean probably had his headphones on. Tupac, or Biggie. So, usually I ended up going to bed at night, curled up on my side of the room, eventually falling asleep staring at the half-empty bottles of cologne on top of Sean's dresser and the jagged up middle drawer. Alone. But I never touch nothing, because it's no fun hiding from headlocks half the night, which is why I never touch nothing of his. No more. It used to be different. When I was twelve and he was sixteen, he would talk trash till one of us. We would talk trash. We would talk trash till one of us passed out. He would tell me about girls, and I would tell him about pretend girls who he pretended were real too, just to make me feel good. He would tell me stories about how the best rappers ever were Biggie and Tupac. But I always wondered if that was just because they were dead. People always love people more when they're dead. And when I was 13, Sean welcomed me into teenage life. With a spritz of his almost grown cologne, said my girlfriend, my first girlfriend would like it, but she hated it, so I broke up with her because, to me, her nose was funny acting. Sean thought that, Sean thought that was stupid and funny, but worthy of joking me, calling me William Worthy, of a headlock that felt like a hood. Now the cologne will never drop lower in the bottles, and I've never, and I'll never go to sleep again, believing in touching them or anything of his will lead to an arm around my neck. But it feels like an arm around my neck, wrenching, just thinking about how I'll never go to sleep again, believing him or believing he will eventually come home, because he won't, and now I guess I should love him more, like he is my favorite which is hard to do because he was my only brother and already my favorite. Suddenly, our room seemed lopsided, cut in half, half empty, half cold, half curious about that one drawer in the middle of it all. The middle drawer called to me. Its awkward off-centeredness, a sign that what was in it could and should be used to set things straight. I yanked and pulled at and snatched at tugged at the drawer until it opened just more than an inch, just wide enough for my 15-year-old fingers to slither in and touch cold steel. A nickname. A cannon. A strap. A piece. A biscuit. A burner. A heater. A chopper. A gat. A hammer. A tool. For, num for rule number three. Which brings me to Carlson Riggs. He also he has known around he was known around here for being as loud as police sirens, but as soft as his first name. People said Riggs talked so much just because he was short, but I think it was because his mom made him take gymnastics when he was a kid, and you are tied to know how to do cartwheels and might be a good idea to also know how to defend yourself. Or at least talk like you can. Okay, everybody, that was the first 51 pages of uh, Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down. Uh, copyright rules. I own none of this, and 
I hope this is in fair use. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Pretty soon I'll be re releasing the... Uh, what is it? Other 50 pages. I'm going to do this by 50 pages. And uh, see you all later. Good. Bye. <laughs>